yeah. I love my HBCU. Uh, and Bob? Bob? I love it, love it. Yeah. I love it, love it. Yeah, yeah. I love my HBCU. Yeah. And man, yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. yeah. I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, two tap. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, he know what he be talking about. Talking about them talk. They know what they be talking about. Talking about. They can press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they won a loss, yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, uh, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, yes. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Phil's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Both Mike and Charles are on the sound. So we have none other than A.D. Drew. I usually guess B.J. Jones is also out on business as well. So we're going to get right to it and get you into the games of the week. And we might as well start off. What everybody was anticipating to be a great game, we want to see what was going on was Number one, Alabama A&M traveling on the road on Thursday to Daytona Beach. And as best plans um, always can go awry, that's what happened here. There's a little cause of Mother Nature called weather. <laughs> Put a pause on the game as everybody was anticipating getting all into it. But when it did start, it seemed to really jump off and give everybody what they needed in terms of the inter inter entertainment value. With that being said, let me jump in here and ask A.D. Drew, what was his thoughts of that matchup? You know something? I was actually kind of glad that there was a weather delay because I was actually able to complete the whole episode of Inside the HBCU Sports Lab with Dr. Cavill watching it before I had to switch over. So I was able to get all my knowledge from you and Charles. Y'all were the only ones uh, there. Everybody else was on assignment that week and did not have to split my attention between the game and the show. So <laughs> from a personal standpoint, I was actually happy. And from the what you're able to see in the game, though, it was it, yes, it was a little a little sloppy. That's the best way to put it. It was definitely a little sloppy. Ball was consistently on the ground. Fumbles, a lot of them were recovered subsequently by the offense. But you know, Alabama A and M thus far through the through the two games, the I got I got to use Mike's words through the two data points that we have will let the opponent. Hang around. Now, does that mean you're playing down to your competition? Or does that mean you just do not have closing ability? We're going to find out as we add more data points to the, to, to the season. But that is the one take that I've, I came out of. It. And, yes, a queer glass is a queer glass. He was able to close out the game. When he when he needed to put that drive together in the fourth quarter to keep the ball away from Bethune to allow his team to continue on and gain the victory. Yeah, no doubt. Um, that last drive before the first half ended was what you look for when you're talking about is somebody able to just really spin it and get it done. He did everything you needed to do in that drive to show you his championship medal, as well as his ability to navigate the space um, from a pro prospect. He got in there and got it done. 
that was really amazing in so many ways in terms of what was going on there. I thought, you know, as many people would have thought that the rain delay, if you would, in terms of um, the wet field being a wet ball, the other thing that you had would have killed glass is the fact that you see that he can throw a wet ball now. That was pretty impressive to get it done there. He thought it was going to slow them down, and it probably did a little bit, but I think Yeah, so we still on her. I can't hear you. Yeah, the stream never stopped. Okay. Well, just uh, talk about I'm, Yeah, I'm just going to bring you back in. Huh? I'm just going to bring, just bring you. I got to. I got to. Okay, so we just in a commercial break with her? Nah, it actually, just, everything just froze for a moment. I'm just to. I'm just to cut and see. Okay, they can hear me. They can. For 200 years, Montgomery, Alabama has been making history by people who had the courage to stand up for change. Today, this riverfront city has been reborn, embracing the past and looking forward to the future. From the National Memorial for Peace and Justice to the stage of the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, this is where history was and is made. We are proud to call Montgomery home, and together, we can be the change. Thank you, guys. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab. Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. They're both on assignment, so we have none, of the, none other than A.D. Drew. As we get back into it, let me give you the proper welcome, and then we'll shout out some people in here uh, but as we do that. So this is Dr. Cavill inside the HBC Sports Lab. Welcome to episode 182 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast. The show is covering the sporting HBC diaspora and all things HBC sports from institutions large and small, from the NAIA to the NCAA. We share insights and information on the athletic programs and the business of HBC sports. I'm your host, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, with my co-host, Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. We're filming from our home studio, getting it done in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. As you know, today's episode is a wrap-up. We just broke down Alabama a and uh, on the road to Daytona, getting that win 30-27. to 27. Uh, Big turnover. People talk about the defense of Alabama a and Bulldogs, but uh, of late, they've been able to come in some big stops when necessary. I think the biggest thing that you talk to me about them is more about their special team as opposed to the defense. The special team has put them in some bad positions. A couple of key turnovers in offense over the last couple of games. But other than that, defense hadn't been as bad as some may think. Can they get has, better? No doubt about it. Has it kind of been the story with a lot of our teams, especially the teams that we expected to win and dominate, that special teams has been the one area this season throughout HBCU football that has, you know, lacked lack behind, for lack of a better words. And when you think about it, most special teams are made up of your number two, your number twos, so, yeah. that they, so that they get reps because of 
opt outs and graduation and and things like that a lot of kids who would have been a number two on a team on is are now a number one so those those kids would normally be special be playing special teams which means your special teams would have been better because of that so it's just something to uh think about when, when you're looking at these special teams a lot of these kids on special teams were not getting reps back in 2019 and because of you know, the division one level because of all the movement through the portal from the spring we're not getting reps in the spring so they those special teams just have not had the reps that we're used to them having. Yeah, I think you make some valid points there in terms of special teams and uh, some reasons why they haven't been on top of the game. And you've kind of seen this throughout sports in general. But that's a fascinating point you make here. Let me run down the scores just for everybody. Then we'll get back into some of the analysis. Uh, as we said, Alabama A&M defeats Bethune Cookman 30-27. Clark Atlanta loses to Shorter 38-17. The battle of the real HU goes to Hampton, 48 to 32 over Howard. You have Tuskegee getting on the winning side of things. They did beat Edward Waters 23 to 6. Pretty sound victory there. As they continue, Tuskegee continues to add on those win top uh, totals as they separate themselves from any HBCU sports out there. You have Bowie State over New Haven, 27 to 13. You have Sacred Heart defeating Morgan State, who is still winless, 21-7 on the season. Some may see this as a surprise, but Shaw is solid in the Southern Division, but it was that magic SIAC ciaa matchup. The CIAA finally gets the best of one of the SIAC teams, and they do it in shutout fashion, 52-0. That Shaw bears over Central State Matador. Keep, keep that opponent in mind when we talk about their score, though, Doc. Yeah, we we get into it. We'll get into it. <laughs> Data points, you know, you know you had Stephen Gates a shout out and said, Hey, CIAA got it done. So yeah, may need some more data points. We'll talk about that even more on Tuesday. Uh, with that for Florida Memorial, HBCU there out of Miami, Greater Miami. Florida loses to Faulkner 34 to 10. Tennessee State gets it done against the Kentucky State. People probably forget the days when they were in the Midwestern Conference together, along with Jack State, Grambling State, Lincoln, to name a few of them, Texas Southern for a short period of time there as well. Uh, Langston continues to win, but they win big. Shut out Wayland Baptist, 50-0, and that was on the road. Surprise here to some, Lane defeats Fort Valley State as they go on the road and get it done, 27-24. Uh, Fort Valley kind of jumped out of there, and then uh, Lane came back, and they just went back and forth for the late game-winning touchdown, essentially, to get it done. Miles finally gets their win when they come to their conference competition to get it done. Dominate Morehouse, 37-14. Central Arkansas holds on and uh, defeats as they turn it on late to defeat Arkansas Pine Bluff, 45-23. Prime Bluff goes on the road and can't get it done, but they show up pretty way late in that fourth quarter, six minutes left before it fell apart. It was an eight-point game with uh, Pine Bluff having the ball, seeking the drive, couldn't get it done. Houston shuts out Gramlin, 45-0. Gramlin's only scored a touchdown on the season thus far. As they struggle, but they did play FBS program, so we'll see what that looks like when they have the big game, State Fair Classic in Dallas next week. Prairie View gets it done as they defeat the second Southland Conference team they play. They win 37 to 27 at home over Houston Baptist. Uh, McNeese comes from behind to defeat Southern at home 20. They defeat them 31 to 24, I should say. Stephen F. Austin uh, takes it to Mississippi Valley 58 to 13. Allen loses to Livingston 32 to 26 in that matchup. Big win there. Oh, is that Allen that got it done? I thought I saw where Allen kicked the late field goal. Uh, but we'll make sure we verify that. Yeah, you he correct. Had, I thought I saw Allen had pulled out that victory also. While you keep going down, I'll, I'll go and see if I can find an uh, alternate score on that. Good deal. Garner Webb, 56 to 0 over Lincoln, Pennsylvania. Blue Field State gets their second win. 
of their short stint of bringing back the football. Amazing. 20 to 12 of John C. Smith. Central State comes from behind to defeat Winston-Salem State, their rival there. Uh, matchup between MEAC and CIAA. 20 to 13. We thought we might see a couple of upsets for the MEAC, but in terms of lease, when they played at CIAA teams, they've got it done. Big wins on the season. Another one was Norfolk State really dominating the City State, 63 to 26. A close one in the Tamer one, top five matchup. Savannah State gets it done at home over Benedict, 41 to 34. Uh, you have Virginia Union in that Willard Bailey Classic, dominate Virginia Lynchburg like they should, should 49 to 7. South Carolina State still looks good, but can't get a win. They lose on the road as they play up to the FBS team, 43-35. South Carolina State is not your grad. That is South Carolina State, not because of in terms of what losses, but the fact that they're putting up points though, on offense. Defense, if they get a couple of things, it'll be interesting they get into that matchup. I'm still looking at that Norfolk State, South Carolina State game to be a doozy. Uh, Fort Hayes State just really – Bangs on Lincoln, Missouri, 17-0. to zero. Losing Mon Monroe escapes Jackson State, 12-7. to seven. Uh, They kick field goals, long field goals, but obviously they add up and defeat Jackson State, 12-7. to seven. South Alabama had its hands full with all four state braves, surprised many people. South Alabama does get it done, 28-21. to 21, But twice late in that game, you had all four state braves driving what could have been the time touchdown? Who knows? They would have went for two. I think that'll be a great question to ask Fred in the Monday morning uh, quarterbacking if you would just see his thoughts and see if we can get an answer out of that. Florida A&M plays pretty soundly against a pretty good South Florida team, especially when you're talking about playing up 38-17. to 17. Are they getting better? Be interesting to see. East Tennessee State, two FCS programs. East Tennessee State, top 25. They pound Delaware State's 38-6 to six as Delaware State plays down on the road. And the last one that was interesting is Valdosta State and Albany State. Uh, they made Albany State come back to earth a little bit, 21-3 to three in that contest. Fascinating work there. Update on that Allen score, Doc. Uh, and I went to both websites to verify this score. Allen 34, Livingstone 32. Yes, yeah, I thought I saw a late clip of a late field goal that won it for Allen. So that's amazing. Program just bringing back football, getting those wins like that. That's pretty big. You got to be excited. We just interviewed Josh Cox, the new athletic director there. You can go and check that out. Um, ECSN, or you can also check it out on Dr. Bill's Inside HBC Sports Lab. Great interview that was done by myself and A.D. Drew. His life would have it. Let's get in here and take our first quarter break uh, as we just snuck in a little snippet there. Let's take a break and we'll get back into it and get into these matchups. We're going to start with that Howard and Hampton uh, matchup to talk about what went on there. Stick with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. Let's get back to strolling instead of scrolling. Before we can safely come together, we need the facts on COVID-19 vaccines. Visit GetVaccineAnswers.org so you can make an informed decision for yourself and for your fam. Support the Black College Sports Network so we can continue to provide you coverage. Go to MyJBN.com slash support and be a part of the Black College Sports Network. Tell everybody they can follow their dreams. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids' apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. the show where we take you inside the game before the game begins. It's, it's the pregame. With your host, Charles Bishop and Neely. 
So get ready, because we pregame harder than the other show's party. It's C Pregame. This is Dr. Bill with Inside HBCU Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. We're in for our Sunday edition wrap up what took place this week in HBCU football. We just gave you the breakdown of some scores, but some of the games that we said were HBCU classic major division games that you should keep your eye on at the major division level was that Battle of the Real HU, Truth and Service Classic, as they call it, held in Audi Field. Howard Bison and Hampton, nice matchup. Did get the screen. That game was lately picked up by Emmett's NBC. Their sports net, part of the network, I should say, with NBC Sports. I was going to go to the news network. That would have been <laughs> That would be news. But I guess when you do talk about it, they were able to put it on the news because you had Vice President Mal Harris there. Uh, she was in the sweet box with the president, Dr. Frederick. Dr. Frederick Wayne Fredericks, that is, over there at Howard University. So they were chatting it up. It was nice niche to see her get out there and support uh, Howard University in the HBCU Classic matchup. Didn't go her way, but I uh, guess, unfortunately for Howard folks, while they are getting to celebrate a lot of other things with big pickups and things of that nature, it's not translating on the field of play or courts, if you would, in terms of wins. They are getting some stuff done in volleyball, won't Make sure that Sherry's not dead. But on the football field, they're struggling. Uh, interesting matchup. Final score is 48-32. Really don't have stats just to throw at you in a lot of big ways. But uh, breakdown on the score part of it. Let's look at that. It went back and forth, really, the first half. You know, score from score, 14-14. Uh, then you had a little distance put in there uh, late. When you're talking about you're going 21 to 17, and then the third quarter, you get explosion from Hampton putting up 30, 21 points. Uh, really sealed the victory. Howard made a late push in the fourth quarter to put up 15, uh, but it was not to be done as you had Hampton also put up 6, 48 to 32. Final score there. What were your thoughts in terms of the matchup there? And then we'll get a little bit. Uh, me after that opening win, Sabo, if you would, from North Carolina Central in terms of their like non-conference HBCU matchups, and even against FCS, they haven't done as well uh, this year as you've seen them done in the past. First, what is your thoughts on the Hampton Howard matchup? Then we'll get into a little more. Well, you talked about those twenty-one points in the third quarter. Those twenty-one points came off of three Howard turnovers which all led to points by Hampton in which Hampton was able to put that distance between them and Howard. Then Howard scored a couple of late touchdowns in the fourth quarter, almost garbage time type touchdowns to make the score look closer than it actually, than it actually was. So, uh, you know, Jeff Duffy had, had a outstanding game. Uh, with a couple of touchdown passes uh, in that particular game also. Yeah, because at the end of the third quarter, it was 42-17, so you're talking about blowout city. Let me give a shout-out to some people in here checking us out before we move on a little bit. Quentin Henry, Demetria, Glenn, Lowell Price, Alan Malone, Karen Griffin is always in here. Good morning, no doubt about it. Weather was nasty. Uh, yeah, throughout the week, you see a little bit of uh, rain get in there. You saw a lot of rain delays uh, throughout the day Saturday. I was a witness to <laughs> to to over an hour delay uh, at, at Tuskegee. So, yes, weather was a factor uh, Saturday. Yeah, no doubt. George Sugg says if South Carolina State gets their defense together, they'll be a true contender for the conference championship and a trip to Atlanta. I agree fully with you, Coach Suggs. In a lot of ways, it's going to be fascinating to see what happens when they play uh, in terms of in the conference measure. What does that defense do? Uh, offensively, we know they can put up some points. So it's not like they won't be able to win those games. I think it's still going to come down to that Norfolk State visiting South Carolina State 
for the conference. I know North Carolina Central says it wants to have something to say about that. And we'll, we'll focus on that as well because we'll talk a little bit about that North Carolina Central. What's Salem State as we break down some of these matchups? Let me get back and shout out some folks. Uh, Holly talked about the weather in the first half was bad, no doubt. Good morning. Data points. The Braves didn't win. The lookout swag. We shall see. Yeah, they look good in that matchup. They defensive looking good. Um, still able to make some key touchdown. Not doing as much offensively as you would, would think, but credit to the defense that puts them in the game and to a senior leadership type team, championship type team uh, that knows how to really pick it up when they have to on the offensive side of the ball. Couldn't quite stick that last touchdown in there. I will ask Fred there this week, uh, Monday, I want to know if he would have scored late in that game, would he kick the extra point, the tax, and then the OT or play like that, or would he win for two uh, to try to make that statement? I'm interested to see. This is my thoughts. I obviously, was not to be, but I'm very curious. Raymond Holby is in here. Georgia also says it's always the small things when you play uh, historically white colleges. Hard nosed football is the way to go. Be very basic in your approach and attacking them. As usual, you'll need that field's fair. Yeah, in terms of the refereeing, you always got to deal with that. I think you make good points. You see that play out in a lot of ways between the McNeese and Southern and what took place at Houston Baptist and Prairie View into home games, very winnable against Southland. One was able to get it done or not. So we'll go a little deeper in that as well. Good morning, Dean and Professor. No doubt about it. We're here in the house. Appreciate you. Uh, let me see you have a couple of more. I want to leave folks out. We'll get back to some of the comments. Great comments. Keep them coming and discussing. Share and send this out so we can get folks in to check out the breakdown. Granlin Dunlap is in here as well. Uh, Odell Bender is in the house. David Nash, Sever Beverly, Justin Kennedy. I also want to get your thoughts in terms of Austin P leaving the OVC. What does that do uh, with that league, Tennessee State as the HBCU? Always the word's going to go up, so I'm fascinated to see what goes on there. But before we have that type of fun, let's get back into this matchup. Matt, these Cowboys come from behind after halftime to defeat what was then uh, number seven, Southern Jaguars, 31 to 24. Give you a little more breakdown when we talk about comfort behind. Yes. Um, Southern went in the half, winning 21 to 10. Uh, so a lot of folks are disappointed in what they've seen in the second half. Credit to the Cowboys, Southland Conference. They get it done. What are your thoughts in terms of that matchup? I mean, the swack after taking a, a beating for the last couple of years when they go out of conference is realizing that they need to play ball in order to make the conference look as good as it is when it comes to the other other media. And the fact that this particular week against like-sized schools, that being FCS schools, SWAC either picked up wins or competed instead of what we've seen the past couple of years where our teams have been losing by 30 and 40 points. So I, I'm, I'm glad that uh, Southern was able to stay around that game, have the lead at halftime at that game, and force McNeese to have that, uh, that wake-up call. Yeah, let's go inside the numbers a little bit in terms of this matchup and then come back and see what stands out for most of you. First downs were pretty even, 17 to 16. But how they got there was interesting. When you look at third down efficiency, sometimes they can tell the story. Not here. I see 7 of 16 for Magnese, 5 of 13. You had some fourth down tries. You had Magnese going four times. They went, I mean, three times, one out of three, uh, while you had Southern only successful on their one of their three attempts going one of two in terms of what went down there. Total yards, 355 total yards for Southern. Put up a lot of yards. Couldn't make it count in terms of getting those points, 263. Uh, when you break it down between the pass and the rushing, uh, pretty even. Southern put up 207 yards, 148. McNeese ran the ball, but they couldn't pass the ball really much at all. Surprising some, 107. But even rushing, they only put up 156 yards, but found a way to get it done in terms of doing that. Penalties uh, speaks to some. 72 yards total, eight penalties. McNeese had six or 38 yards. So you can see the penalties that Southern had were more egregious. Um, 
wasn't too bad there. Big part, turnovers. Southern two, they need zero. Even in terms of time, possession, really close, 30 to 13, 29 to 47. So again, one fumble and one interception thrown in that match. Tell me a little more about this game in terms of some of those numbers. What stuck out for you, A.B.? Did you mention the total yards, Dr. Cavill? Yes. Three, yeah, 355 to 263. That means Southern is, uh, is getting it done on offense. Uh, and defensively, that means that they were pointing on all cylinders. If you take those two turnovers away, then there's a good chance Southern could have won that particular ball game. So Southern, just look at the numbers. Southern knows where they need to go to clean up what they need to clean up in order to uh, in order to win some of these games. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be fascinating in a lot of ways. Um, Southern has a peculiar fan base. I mean, not only do they want to win, it's very fascinating. And this is not to disparage them. It's just to let people in that world. But um, even if they come out, you know, they'll be excited about getting it done in the West if they're able to do it representing in the SWAC championship game. Love to have it at home, obviously. They'll travel well if they're on the road. And certainly, they find a way in the celebration bowl. They're going to look to get it done. But this is a tough loss at home to make meets on the new coach. I think fan base really expected that they would win this game. And then I think the fact, the way they lost it is even going to be a more chilling factor to many of the Southern Jaguar fans out there. So but Doc, um, when is the last time a SWAC team beat McNeese? You know, it seems like McNeese always plays one to two SWAC opponents per year. Uh, it's 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 been a while since they beat them, but I'm talking about in terms of what Southern expectations were, not in terms of the past history. And even in those matchups, other than the one where they really blew out Prairie View, just didn't work out, end up putting the coach in a bad position where he wasn't retained. But even in those games, like you talked about earlier, they've been pretty competitive in those games. And oddly enough, the same thing that seemed to have done them in in this game was that last time they played Magnesia, it was a you know, six-point game, one-score game, and they had six turnovers. So for whatever reason, they can't uh, really control the ball. But one of the things that a lot of fans were excited about the new coaching staff is to think that they would get a much more disciplined, cleaner team. Uh, we're concerned with that. So I'm talking about just in terms of the fans' expectations, not necessarily on past history, which is a good point in terms of SWAT. I think thus far, uh, oddly enough, Prairie View has probably been one of the better teams in the SWAT, getting wins outside the conference at the FCS level. Uh, people have really picked on Prairie View and probably think that program is not quite where it should be after the championship going back to 2009 because they've always lost the key game, whether it was to Grambling or Southern. In some cases, it was both. But most of the year, they would beat one of the teams but lose the other. And then, obviously, they've taken that recent slide a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, they would take care of Texas Southern. We've always seen that, get it done against Pine Bluff. And they usually would lose a non-conference game against all four. They had them on the schedule, even though they were in the East. So they would fall in the middle of the framework. but if you look closer, they were always in those games. They had the same problem. You see Southern out of conference turnovers. But that belabors the point. Let's get back into it and talk about Prairie View now as they get it done for the conference, winning 37 to 27. Uh, in terms of this matchup, you talk about the tale of one quarter versus the rest of the game was fascinating. It was 21 to 20, and they literally just seemed to be going up down the field, couldn't stop either one of extra Point was missed by Prairie early in the game. Then they really changed the game in the second quarter. If it wasn't for a late uh, roughing the quarterback penalty by Prairie on Houston Baptist, uh, it would be interesting. To they would have basically would have shut them out. The penalty to put them in the position to kick the point with no time on the clock. So obviously, game cannot end on a defensive penalty or even go to the halftime. So they got one more play and they chose to kick a field goal, long field goal, got it done. Um, and then you see they did shut out in the fourth quarter, only gave them three points in the third. So talk about shutout. The game breaker, though, was a 
interception uh, pick six for Prairie View to really pull away as you had a nip and tuck. But they get it done, 37-27. Big win for Dooley. Uh, you have some folks questioning some things there. I'm not sure if I'm on that boat, but just to be fair, we're looking out there. Uh, but Prairie View has stepped out of conference the last couple of years, and they've got it done. They have a win over Stephen F. Austin over the last period of time, incarnate word before they lost here. Um, and they had Sam Houston State at home uh, where they didn't get it done, but they get it done this time. So credit to Coach Dooley, the Panthers, and the coaching staff. Big win for Prairie View in the conference. But it gets interesting as we'll sneak this in there. Next week they go back in the conference play. Big ride against Gramlin. Gramlin comes in 0-3, but they're going to think they can write the ship a lot of ways as they get it done. I should say 0-3. They did get their win over Tennessee State. I'm thinking about Tennessee State that uh, – was only two going in the game against Kentucky State. They get the victory. So both teams are now one and two. Uh, but what are your thoughts in terms of Houston Baptist Prairie View game uh, as you see the breakdown there? You know, at, it seems like after last week getting cursed by a Christian based university, they were able to get blessed by a Christian based <laughs> university <laughs> this week. So, uh, you know, I, I did not. Actually get a chance to see that game. I know you as a uh, alum got a, a great chance to see that game and have not been able to pull up the stat cast or the uh, statistics on that game. But it's going to be interesting to see Grambling, who has not been able to score a touchdown uh, on the season or more than one touchdown on the season, and yeah. Prairie View offensively. Has not looked bad all season long. It's just been other issues that have stopped Prairie View from winning. So I really want to see how that matchup is going to be in and, and what's the tail of the West going to be. And quietly kept, Prairie View wins their game. They're 2 0 in the West. Yep, with a big that, matchup. That oh, puts them. The final, the pre yes, previous that puts game. them to, into the conversation portion. Of the West, if oh, no they, if they, they game uh, against, against Grambling, they get it done against Grambling. They certainly start to be uh, considered a question. But Prairie View's done that over the last couple of seasons. So those naysayers will say, "Well, this is what Prairie View do." Prairie View does, I should say, they get off to a hot start and they fade at the end. But I think they get a chance to seriously make the first statement. I believe they will get through Grambling. Um, but let's say if, that they able to. The big game that really is going to tell the tape to me is the fact that they have Pine Bluff at home, which yeah. many people quietly believe certainly should be getting more conversation than they're getting. But let's get to all, the next one. All I'm going to say is everybody. Oh, I was going to say everybody said that about Pine Bluff until last year that Pine Bluff would get off to a good start and fade at the end. Pine Bluff finally found a way to get it done back in the spring. So maybe Prairie View is the Pine Bluff of the fall. Great point. Great point. Uh, number five, North Carolina Central will come from behind uh, to win as they defeat uh, rival Winston-Salem State 20 to 13. I know I looked at this at halftime. I was like, ooh -wee. Interesting. But uh, Carolina gets it done when you say North Carolina Central. A big win by the Eagles as uh, they move forward 2-1 on the season. Final way to get it done. You got to give some conversation about this uh, Eagle team that many people are looking at, either South Carolina City, North Fork State, they continue to tell folks, it's like, all right, continue to ignore us. We'll just show you on the field. Uh, but they get it done. What are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? As I said, Eagles come from behind after trailing 6-3 uh, to three, uh, at the half. Uh, Eagles struggled. They pulled out 14 points in the fourth quarter. Yeah, the Eagles struggled in this game in order to uh... – in order to win this game. And it's the question of, once again, did Central play down to its competition or is Winston-Salem quietly getting back on that Winston-Salem winning tr tradition? Because I'll, I only caught the last maybe 12 minutes of the game because I flipped over to that game after the Jackson State game had, uh, had gone off. And... Central did what it had to do to win late in that particular ball game with that uh with that late drive and then stopping them defensively in the uh for, in the fourth quarter, but uh, 
here, here's the big question, Dr. Kavir. Got the Aggie Eagle Classic next week. Woo! Now, Central wins that Aggie Eagle Classic. They are considered arguably the best football team, HBCU-wise, in the state of North Carolina. Six weeks ago, would we have even thought to put those words out coming out of our mouth? No, I, I doubt it. Great point when you talk about what they've been able to do against the rivals. Next big one, though, is a big one. They got to find a way. If they get it done there, uh, they'll have a lot of eyes kind of looking uh, over there at the Eagles saying, hey, what did and, we miss? And also, it'll be a wake-up call to the rest of the BAC. Uh, with them, especially with South Carolina State struggling, like, hey, all you got to do is come north one state and maybe we can, uh, maybe we'll be back in Atlanta and, and they would be, to my recollection, the first team to compete in the BX Swack Challenge and the Celebration Bowl in the same season. No, that's correct. We've never had a team that's been able to play and then find a way and reach it back. Some teams that were in the hunt but couldn't get it done at the end. So that'd be fascinating if they make that statement and plant their flag in Atlanta. No doubt about it. Let's take our last break here. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Mike Washington and Charles Bishop are out on assignment with none other than A.D. Drew bringing it up. Shout out to B.J. Jones. Check out his show this evening as well. A.D., let's take it to the break. We'll be back to talk about the mid-major games of the week. When you're looking for the latest information on Southern University sports, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and HBCU athletics, there's only one place to go. Tune in to the Carlos Brown Show, exclusively on the Black College Sports Network. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Your ad could be ran here. MyJBN.com backslash support. MyJBN.com backslash support for more information. Um, can I get the now bar, please? One dollar. Have a good one. You got it. Hey, what's going on? Hey. hey let me get a now bar. Sure. One dollar. Appreciate you. You got it. It's like a loot machine. This is Dr. Bill's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington, Charles Bishop. Before we get into mid-majors, it would be inappropriate if I didn't do our cigar shout-out to the Panthers getting it done with the victory this week. As we say, Slow Burns of Waco, that's www.slowburns, slowburnwaco.com. That's S-L-O-W-B-U-R-N, waco.com. From novice to official, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal consumer service. Check them out. Slow Burns as, again, shout out to the path of faithful Mike Washington getting it done with the cigars. Thought for a minute, though, I was going to get a shout out to Jackson State. Couldn't quite get it done. Big touchdown throw in the corner. But other than that, couldn't get much offense going there. Uh, defense continues to do what it does, but let's get back to some of these mid-major matchups here. Get into it. We talked about the way Willard Bailey Classics, Virginia Panthers get it done, defeating Virginia Lynchburg 49-7. to uh, The Panthers really dominated this game. Um, they will be in the hunt in that Northern Division. This is just another indication. They play some tough non-conference games. 
Uh, but they'll be back into it as you start to get in that conference play earnestly now. Any thoughts in terms of this game uh, in terms of the Panthers over Virginia and Lynchburg? Honestly, Doc, no. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> needs a Virginia Lynchburg on their schedule to get <laughs> the ship righted. After the beatings, Union has taken the first two weeks of the season. Thank God we had Lynchburg on the schedule. Uh, I, I I know Alex Hines may be uh, saying saying something contrary to what I'm saying, but everybody needs a little Lynchburg in their life. No doubt about it. So many different ways. But that being said, let's get into a bigger win. Number three, Bowie State Bulldogs get it done on the road. Uh, New Haven Chargers winning against the historically white college. Uh, the fact that they go out of the regional, as you talk about, in terms of seating, seedings, playoffs, you know, that's part of what Bowie State is pushing for, get back in there and see if they can make a run in the playoffs. So uh, getting their team used to playing in tough environments is important. Um, and they get it done. Two and one on the season goals, Bulldogs, as they drop the New Haven Chargers to 0-2. Credit as they come from behind. You know, they were right there in that mix. Jumped out early, and then New Haven put in some play, uh, plays to get it done. But the Bulldogs prevail, and that's over a team out of the Northeast 10 Conference. What are your thoughts in terms of Bowie State getting with the victory? I mean, when you go back to the beginning of the season with the game against Delaware State, that's obviously the outlier for, for Bowie State. You know, they, they played the FCS program. Fellow FBS, uh, HBCU, we all know we call them check games, but they were able to compete in that game, just were not able to get it done. Now, when the NCAA looks at Bowie State schedule, that game is not con is not even factored in one way or the other as far as does Bowie State get into a playoffs and what their seeding is. That was a game for the, for the fans. For the HBCU people, the no, no, State no, going no. out and get, getting this done against on their own level and having convincing w victories on their own level is what's going to be the statement. And yes, Bowie will be back in the playoffs one way or the other. And I am so looking forward to Bowie and Shawan later on in the season because that's Ooh. going to determine. Probably, in my opinion, who's going to win the CIAA door? Shawan, not a traditional HBCU, but competes in an HBCU conference and has dominated outside of the CIAA, which also helps a Bowie State, a Virginia State, because that makes the conference record look better. So they're not, they're point, not one of our brothers, point. but they are, they are, they are our brothers. When it comes to the CIAA, no doubt about it. I mean, they're a conference member, not a HBCU. Um, so sometimes you won't see me put them in the rankings because the rankings for HBCU. But in terms of matchup and comp conference competition, certainly uh, need to understand about uh, what Shawan is doing, and it's going to be a fascinating matchup. They've been building towards this, can't quite get over the hump, but it looks like this year might be the year uh, they can find a way to dig in get to the championship game, and obviously play for ultimately the CIAA champ, championship in the playoff. Getting back to it, we had another SIC CIAA matchup. This may surprise some. Shaw Bears is picked finished second in the uh, CIAA, uh, while not so much for Central State. But you've seen SIC dominate the CIAA in what appears to be Pretty even matchups. Well, not so much. Shaw Bears dominated the Central State Matadors, fifty-two to zero. Shut them out. So both teams moved to one and two. Shaw improves to uh, one and two, while Central State drops to one and two on the season. What are your thoughts in terms of this SIAC I know you like the idea of these cross-sectional uh, matchups between the two HBC conferences as they play a game or two, also in terms of regional alignment against historically white colleges. What are your thoughts in terms of this matchup? Shaw expected to be one of the top teams in the CIAA South. Central expected to be one of the bottom teams in the SIAC West. This game is what we thought it would be. You know, top tier team in one conference against a bottom tier team in 
another conference. You expected Shaw to come out and win. You expected Shaw to come out and dominate that game, in which it did. Honestly, Dr. Kavir, this game says nothing to me about the cross-section games between these two conferences. How you evaluate it, when you got a top dog in one conference versus a top dog in another conference, or bottom dog, bottom dog, then you get a clearer picture of where these conferences rank and who's the better conference uh, of the two. Right now, it's still SIAC. That game, is, that game is what we thought it was going to be. Great point there. Before I jump to our last game, which um, was billed as one of the best games of the week, especially at the mid-major, probably the best game in terms of ranked teams, top five matchups between Savannah State and Benedict, I want to get into a game that ended up being really good. It's one that we said keep your eyes on. Watch this one on ESPN Plus. As Lane scores late, get it done against Fort Valley State to kind of throw uh, the divisions in some tizzies as Fort Valley was just moving around, making some statements, uh, but couldn't pull away from Lane. As Lane just plucked away, plucked away, stayed in the game, gave themselves a chance. And certainly on that last drive, they get it done. Uh, they get an interception by the quarterback when Fort Valley looked like they was driving to take the go-ahead touchdown to go ahead and pull a uh, win, grab it out of the hat uh, in that matchup. Lane gets a interception right in the end zone, uh, misread to some degree uh, by the quarterback, tried to throw in the fade in the left corner of the end zone, couldn't quite get it there, front side of it. And Lane Dragons get it done. They defeat Fort Valley State as they improve uh, to 2-1 and one on the season and drop. Fort Valley State for one or two. Fascinating when you talk about that matchup. Um, do you want to say anything about that? I know that wasn't a prime game, but. Yeah, this is one of those quirks on the SIAC schedule where the game counted as a conference victory for Lane. The well, game did not count for Fort Valley. And if anybody's oh, familiar with the SIAC, there is a little quirk with the West teams because the, the, the schedule is unbalanced because of Morehouse. You have an odd number of teams. So once a year, once per, once per team schedule in the West, there's a game that counts against the Eastern opponent on the Western team schedule, but does not count for the Eastern team. This is one of those games. That game does not hurt Fort Valley. In the conference standings, yep. whereas it helps Lane, puts Lane one and zero in the conference standings, and puts them right there with Kentucky State as far as conference victories. Both of them have one conference victory now. It gives Lane a a marker. So whenever you're evaluating these SIAC East West matchups, one of the first things you need to do is. Go to the website, go to the schedule, go to both team schedules and see if it counts as a conference game for both teams when you have those cross those cross divisional games. Perfect. Great point. With that being said, let's get in this top five matchup. Number four, Benedict Tigers. They travel on the road to the Tigers of Savannah State, ranked number five. Number five gets it done at home. Defeats Benedict. We had split folks pulling both of these teams and winning. It lives up to it. Classic matchup, 41-34. Really a barn burner down there in Georgia uh, in terms of Savannah. The Dick Tigers couldn't get it done. You give credit to Savannah State. They improved the 2-1, 1-0 one, one as you talk about uh, East Division race here. So very important matchup because they dropped Benedict to 2-1, and one, first loss on the season at 0-1 in the conference race. What are your thoughts on this matchup? Boy, what an exciting game. Yes, it was. I caught the the third quarter. Inch. I picked up the game when Benedict was in its run. Uh, Benedict was trailing, I believe, 34 to, to 13 at one point in this game. Scored 21 unanswered points to tie the game in the fourth quarter. Had an opportunity to take the lead. Savannah got it done defensively. Scored, scored a touchdown, and then Benedict, it literally came down to the last play of the game to know if we were going to have overtime or not. Benedict with the ball, 
as as time expired, could not get it done to tie Savannah State uh once once again. So uh great, great game. Turnovers what was the key to the Benedict run in the third quarter. Turnovers, special teams, and lack of execution in, in those departments by Savannah State. So Benedict showed me they are going to be a team that's if this was a bracket, they're going to be a bracket buster team Ooh. for those in the SIAC East. Savannah State, I need you to be on upset alert. That's that's uh that's another game. Yeah, that, they're the hunted. They're the hunted now. Exactly. You 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 on paper have the better team, were the favorite in that game, and the game was a lot closer than it needed to be. So Savannah State, if you continue to let these bottom dwellers, and I, and I call it Benedict the bottom dweller, but if you continue to let these other games stay around by making mistakes, it's sooner or later it is going to bite you in the you-know-what, Doc. Yes, point well taken. Let me get in here before we get and ask you what are some of your key matchups coming in this week um, as we close out there. Um, George Slug says, uh, Aggies 50, North Carolina Central 14. It will not be close. <laughs> He's talking about it. it would never happen. Who <laughs> would the upset? Uh, great point. Not We didn't say it will. We just said it'd be interesting. But, yeah, you're right. It's going to be hard for the Eagles. But rivalry games, that's what they come down to oftentimes. G. Boone says he forgot to take pictures with the cigars, although there was plenty being smoked after the PBN game, no doubt about it. I'm still think SU will not be the same without Odoms. Yes, some people, great point. There's a lot of folks who are talking about the tougher teams being all four in the Southern. That remains to be seen for 2021. They're expected to be the tougher team, but uh, like I said, it's, it's going to be fascinating to see this Southern the championship level that many people expected them to be. All corners saw some chinks in the armor. Obviously, they played well. Uh, data points continue to point that. But it's not like you see all corners where they were a couple of years ago, where they dominated. And even at that time, Prairie View played them close when you just talk about those particular matchups. Turnovers in those games for Prairie View have usually been their downside. So have Prairie View got rid of those turnover bugs? Are they ready to ascend? Or will this be the same Prairie View? We get a glimpse as that starts over the next couple of weeks as we start to earn us, get into conference matchups, at least for the SWAC, SIAC, and CIAA. Still have a little time uh, for the MEAC, but we'll start getting those games. Speaking of upcoming games, got another big one. Those Thursday night games on ESPNU are starting to shine in terms of the matchups. Uh, you have Alcorn traveling to Arkansas Pine Bluff, 6 o'clock kickoff game. Since the standard time, it'll be fascinating to see uh, which one of these two teams will get the edge. These are teams that people believe should be uh, in the upper half. Some people are sliding Arkansas Pine Bluff. Well, this is a chance for them to make a statement. Uh, we will see. Um, as I said, they held their own in a lot of ways against the top 20 team in Central Arkansas. So if that's an indication, it'll be fascinating. Kind of continue on to see what is going on with Allen. Can they continue uh, to be that uh, – Star getting it done against Fort Valley State. Any other games that you think we should keep our eyes on this week for you, AD? Well, shout out to Bluefield State. Yes. Defeating another CIAA <laughs> opponent. Yes. Yes. yes as, a, as a Division II independent in their first season since 1941. How many wins? Does Bluefield State have compared to the, the, some of these CIAA teams that they that that they do been, that they've been playing again? You know, shout out shout out to Bluefield State, and it's uh, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if it's just Bluefield State versus the CIAA or Bluefield State in general as they continue to play kind of a you know what they could pick up on the Division Two level as uh now they're done with all the hbcus on their uh schedule now they'll be playing hwcus for the remainder of the year that's one team i am really going to take a look at and keep keep an eye on they're not eligible for the playoffs this year but maybe they're building something uh there in 
in West Virginia. Well, point well taken. A couple of other matchups I sneak in there is obviously we, we talked about just a little bit that North Carolina A&T, North Carolina Central game. Central travels to Greensboro. Always a tough place to play. Um, they'll be lathered up to make a statement in terms of just where they believe the separation is between the Aggies and the Eagles. Um, Lane uh, has another one, Edward Waters, obviously. Uh, Edward Waters is transitioning to SIC, so just keep that up there. SWAT just has uh, games galore. They're starting to get into it. Bethune Cookman, Alabama State, that's in Montgomery. Uh, that will be a fascinating one. Alabama State is the one I want to get on, off the road as they get in the conference play. Bethune Cookman is one to bounce back. Shouldn't see much against Bowie State, Livingston, but uh, conference game. So you, you give them a puncher's chance. You want to see where that goes. Obviously, we talked a little bit about the Prairie View Grambling and State Fair Class. Fascinating there. In some ways, but those are some of the games uh, on the list. Jackson State is always going to be intriguing. They take on D2, uh, Delta State. Uh, Delta State over the years can be a power at the Division II level, so there'll be another chance. Jackson State played up, Monroe coming in the game, but uh, there's another statement where they don't want to have the relapse of letting themselves down playing Delta State. So fascinating to see what that looks like. But those are some of the uh, games of the week that, I, that you probably want to keep your eyes on. Any Last comments for you, Eddie Drew. Yes, uh, I need you to send. I only get one cigar this week, Dr. Cavill, as Tuskegee finally got off the schneid and <laughs> was able to defeat Edward Waters. I still need the weekend where I can, where I can hold one in both hands. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and that. it probably won't be next weekend as Tuskegee takes on Alabama A and M. So. You, you got. You probably have at least two weeks before we have to. Uh, before we have to send me two cigars, Dr. Kavir. Uh, no doubt about it. We'll make sure you get those cigars and <laughs> get both those teams winning at the same time. Just shout out to Stiggy, as you said, they get off of that uh, winless season at this point. Big for them. Needed that victory. We'll see what that means moving forward. Yeah. And don't forget, we got a Sunday matchup uh, also. Uh, versus the U two schools will take its toll on game outcomes. Interesting. Go ahead. I would say, don't forget, we've got to also have a Sunday matchup that will be featured on uh, ESPN Plus as Southern travels to Mississippi Valley. Oh, excuse me. Southern versus Mississippi Valley in Jackson on uh, on Sunday at 3 o'clock Eastern, 2 o'clock Central in the, Bayou, in the Delta Bayou Classic. So for all those in uh, Central Mississippi, you've got – back-to-back days of good HBCU football with your own Jackson State taking on Delta State on Saturday and Southern taking on Mississippi Valley State on Sunday. And Jackson State has only given up one touchdown on the season, and that was on a blow coverage during garbage time. When will somebody actually score against Jackson State for real? Woo-hoo! Question of the day. Good one. That's the one to get us out on here. Thanks for listening to outside uh, on Inside the ADCC Sports Lab as we're going on the outside now. Make sure you share our <laughs> podcast with your friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Niyata Gaville, the Dean of HBC Sports, coming from Inside the Lab in the College of HBC Sports with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Hope you enjoyed A.D. Drew coming in and filling in spots, giving us some additional information. We look forward to next week as we discuss uh, latest in the news coming back. Those poll rankings will be out on Tuesday. The bowl uh, marching sport power rankings will be out on Thursday. And we'll have new matchups. So send me in. If you think there's some key matchups, send them to me on Messenger. We'll see, uh, evaluate those and see if we can get them in and give you some dialogue on what you think uh, are some matchups mixed in what we will tell you are some matchups or suggest to you are some matchups you should think about. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. That is D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-A-C-A-V-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab 1 on Twitter. Facebook and YouTube is Inside the HBC Sports Lab. Dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Courts, A.D. Watch out for those lengths and lines. Lecture. Dismiss. Great point on the lines. They continue to rock and roll. Why? Get it done. Shout out to those links in the line.